Hello everyone, Rachel Weaver here. I am on faculty and staff at Lighthouse Writers Workshop. I've been making a series of videos in which I ask authors to tell us the story of how their books came to be in the world. Um, so today with us, we have Andrew Altschul. Thank you for being here, Andrew. Thanks, I'm really happy to be here, Rachel. Andrew is the director of the creative writing program at CSU. He, his most recent novel, his third, called The Gringa, came out uh, the day before the pandemic was announced. <laughs> Or I guess that it was at the day before every with all the stay at home orders came out. Is that what happened? No, no, no. it was uh, it was it was March 10th, um, Tuesday, March 10th. And on March 11th was when the World Health Organization first put the label pandemic on the, <laughs> on the COVID-19 crisis. Uh-huh. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Andrew, and um, let you talk about any aspect of putting out any of those three books or all of them or whatever, whatever direction you want to take us. Sure. Okay. I'm, I'm happy to. Um, and this is the new book. It's called The Gringa, and it came out from Melville House, like I said, uh, on March 10th. Um, it's my third book. It's, it's my first book in nine years. Um, and, and I worked on the book pretty much nonstop throughout those nine years, a lot longer than it took me to write um, either of my previous books. Um, I'll tell you just a, a little bit about the book, and, and that'll help me to maybe explain why it took so long to, uh, to write it and, and also to publish it. Um, the Gringa is based on a, on a true story. It was inspired by the case of, a, of an American activist named Lori Berenson, who in 1995 was arrested in Lima, Peru, um, uh, and charged with um, terrorism and treason. Um, she was renting a house in the suburbs of Lima and there were 12 uh, leftist militants living in the house. The government claimed that they were um, planning to stage a military style invasion of the country's Congress and abduct legislators um, and commit other uh, acts of violence. Um, and Berenson was tried in a military court and convicted and sentenced to life in a military prison. She ended up serving 15 years of the sentence uh, before being paroled in 2010 um, and eventually allowed to leave Peru in 2015. And this was a case I'd been interested in for a very long time. I lived in Peru for a couple of years in the late 1990s, a couple of years after Berenson's arrest and trial and incarceration. Um, and it was frequently in the news, even though the, the crisis had passed. Um, every time uh, there, was, there was some new bit of information or some uh, motion for a retrial or something like that, uh, the press would gin up the whole case again. And she had really become sort of the most hated person, certainly the most hated foreigner in Peru. She was the gringa terrorist who had uh, in the government's uh, story had come down to, the, to Peru to foment violence, to foment revolution. Uh, the country had recently um, gotten out of a 12 year long uh, dirty war in which the government had, had mounted a counterterrorism operation against a Maoist revolutionary group called the Shining Path. And 70,000 people had been killed in that conflict. So there was very, very little appetite in the country um, for anyone who was espousing um, uh, armed struggle against the government for, for whatever reasons. Um, <clears throat> so this was a case that was really fascinating to me, but it wasn't until she was paroled in around 2010 that I started thinking about writing a novel about it. And it took me um, almost eight years to, to write it. Um, it was, first of all, extremely complicated material. Um, for one thing, uh, the reality of what happened in Lima and what Lori Berenson did or didn't do has never been very clear. She's always claimed that she was absolutely innocent, had no idea that the people living in her house were members of this revolutionary group, had no intentions of, of, of doing anything but writing some articles for left-wing magazines, um, whereas the government sort of portrayed her as as Peru's Osama bin Laden, for lack of a better comparison. Uh, and both of those stories seemed completely preposterous to me. Um, but figuring out what happened and, and where in the middle of those extremes, the truth lies was very, very complicated. Um, and furthermore, I had to really educate myself on a lot of things about Peruvian history, 
um, especially recent history that I didn't know, even though I had lived in the country, I knew very little bit, little about the war, very little about the Shining Path um, or the Tupac Amaro movement, which was the the um, the group that Berenson was was accused of joining. Um, so the research took just a, a tremendous amount of time. Uh, I made five or six extended trips to Lima in the course of uh, of five years. Um, and spoke to dozens of people from all walks of life, rich people, poor people, journalists, activists, former militants, former soldiers, um, attorneys, um, uh, people who had, who had lost family members who had either um, been killed in terrorist attacks or had been um, disappeared by the government and never come home. Um, and wrapping my head around all of this and feeling like I had any kind of um, competence in discussing this material really took a long time. Um, but then beyond that, there was the question of whether I was the right person to tell this story, you know, as a, as a, as a privileged white American coming down to try to tell a story about a national tragedy, a national trauma like this, one that, you know, quite frankly, uh, didn't affect my life at all. Um, you know, you can have the best intentions in writing other people's stories, but still that doesn't give you the right to, um, to claim their perspective or to claim that you have any real authority over the material. And it took me a really long time to figure out um, how to navigate that. Um, and what really sort of turned the corner for me was uh, I was in Lima and I was talking to a, an old friend of mine who's lived there um, since the very early 90s, a Canadian journalist who had briefly covered the Laurie Berenson trial. And I said to her, you know, I'm just not, I've been working on this book for a long time, but I'm just, I'm not sure I can write it. I mean, I don't, I don't think I have the right to write it. I mean, who, who am I to, to tell these stories that mean so much more to other people than they mean to me? Um, and she said, well, you know, in a way you're Laurie Berenson. And I said, I don't understand what you mean by that. And she said, well, think about it. You know, you're both outsiders. You're both privileged Americans coming down here with the best of intentions. Um, but you don't know as much as you think you know. You can never really see the world through the perspective of Peruvians or, or people who had lived through the dirty war of the early 90s. Um, and there's always the risk of making an enormous mess of things, which is, which is exactly what Berenson did. Um, and exactly what I feared that I would do in trying to write this book. But in thinking about that parallel, it really opened up um, an avenue to, um, to tell the story in what felt like a responsible or an ethical way. Um, so the novel that I wrote is narrated by another American expatriate um, who goes only by the name of Andres. And he is sort of strong-armed into writing a profile of this gringa terrorist mastermind, as she's known by the government. Um, but he is the least qualified person in the world to write it. Um, he's in Peru to have a good time, to get away from being an American. He's moved down there in the aftermath of 9-11 and the um, Iraq invasion and the scandal at the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. Um, and he wants nothing to do with politics, but through a series of events, he's, um, he's convinced to write this story and he very, very quickly comes up against the fact that he doesn't, he doesn't know the things he needs to know, he doesn't understand the things he needs to understand, and he doesn't really have any right to tell the story. And so his attempts, nevertheless, to tell a story that he has come to see as, as a very important story, something he really wants the world to understand, that, that drama becomes part of the drama of the novel. So it's, it's, first of all, it's the story of this American woman who involves herself in Peruvian politics um, and comes to a, a very unpleasant end. But it's also a story about the difficulty of writing stories and about um, the ethical minefield of trying to write other people's stories, especially if those are people um, of other genders, other nationalities, other languages, other cultures, and other histories. And um, so enacting that problem in the novel was the way that I decided to cop to all of my own worries about, um, about whether I really had any right to write the material. Once I got the book done, <clears throat> then the fun part really started, which was trying to get it published, and it took quite a while. Um, American publishers 
are um, shockingly resistant to fiction with explicit political content. Um, and when they are interested in it, they really, um, they, they, they are much more interested in stories that center um, the inner lives of Americans um, that really think in terms of um, heroes and villains. Um, they're enamored of coming of age stories. And this was a novel that didn't really fit into any of those categories. I spoke to a number of editors who said, well, you know, maybe you could downplay the stuff about, you know, this, this dirty war in Peru and Latin American history and just think more about the emotional journey of your protagonist. And first of all, I think the emotional journey of my protagonist is quite present in the book. But I also think that that to say that that's more important than the death of 70,000 Peruvians or the, or the trauma of, of, of millions of Peruvians during the decades of the 80s and 90s is, is a deeply immoral um, position to take. And I refused to write that book. Um, and so that really limited um, my opportunities to publish it. It was turned down by over 20 editors um, until finally Melville House uh, acquired the book uh, in early 2019, and I'm really grateful to them for having done so. And they are a, a publishing house. They're the exception in that they have always been interested in um, literature with with um, with uh, really strong uh, political consciousness and political positions. And um, to their great credit, you know, they never once asked me to tone down any of the politics to um, simplify any of the history to back away from any of the really complicated um, stories that wove their way into the novel. So I'm happy that I, I found my way to Melville House and um, all's well that ends well, I thought. Um, and then of course the book was published on March 10th of this year um, and all those other um, obstacles have come to seem um, quite easily surmounted compared to um, the COVID-19 crisis. So. It hasn't been easy, but, uh, but the book's out. Um, I hope people will check it out. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's been a long story. It's, it's, it's never been um, a smooth ride, but um, I guess it's been more fun that way. I'm not sure. Uh, I have a couple, um, a couple questions that occurred to me as you were, think, as you were talking. I wonder, yeah. first of all, um, did you ever reach out to Lori Berenger? Did you say her last name was? It, it's Berenson. Um, Berenson? No, no, I didn't. Um, and, and, I, and I didn't for, for very deliberate reasons. Um, you know, over the course of, of my research, Ema, um, there were a number of, of occasions when people I was talking to would say to me some version of, if you're interested, I know somebody who knows somebody who might be able to put you in touch. Um, and the first time someone said this to me, I, I thought about it. I mean, it was tempting, um, but pretty soon I decided I did, I did not want that. And, and afterwards, anytime it, it, it came up, um, uh, I declined immediately. And, and the reason is this, the, um, this is a novel, it's fiction. It was never meant to be a definitive version of what really happened. It makes no claims to be the true story of what happened um, to Lori Berenson, what she did or didn't do, what was done or not done to her. That right there, ethically, is, is, is tricky enough. Um, mm -hmm. I set out to, to take the very broad outlines of the story, outlines that anybody who, who kind of looked into it in, in published news um, uh, it, it, it's, it's accessible to, to anybody. And I wanted to take that, the outlines of that story and use it to investigate um, certain, certain ideas, certain psychology, a certain um, take on history that's really mine. And I didn't want it to make any claims to being Laurie Berenson's that I don't have the right to do that. Um, and mm -hmm. so as much as it might interest me in real life to meet this person, and to hear from her own lips what, what really happened through, through her perspective. I felt that if I were to do that, um, 
uh, then it would really be impossible for me to write a book that that fictionalized that 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 would really cross an ethical line. It, it, if it was going to be her story that she told to me, then it has to be her story. But the novel I wrote is 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 my story that sort of uses the broad outlines of hers as a jumping off place, and so I needed to keep that distance between us. But that's a great question. Mm -hmm. The other question that occurred to me as you were speaking is. Um, I'm wondering if your previous two novels were based around something true like this, or if this was a, a divergence from, from the way you had written the other two novels. Yeah. Um, so my, my first novel um, was very loosely related in that it is also a kind of speculative history um, taking off not so much from specific events as, as specific figures. It's a, um, the novel is called Lady Lazarus. It was published in 2008. Um, and it's a largely satirical novel um, about poets and um, punk rock stars and celebrity suicides. Um, and the main character is the daughter of um, two uh, early 90s um, uh, punk rock uh, sensations who look a lot like Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love. Um, and after her father's suicide, the daughter, whose name is Calliope, grows up to be um, a confessional poet um, and becomes quite famous in her own right and drags tabloid scandal behind her wherever she goes. And so, um, you know, on the one hand, a lot less at stake, a lot less serious history to kind of um, to master or to tiptoe around. I mean, it was a lot more fun writing Lady Lazarus than it was writing the gringa. Um, but a similar project aesthetically, a similar um, uh, sort of dance that you do with history and with real life and, and weaving it into your own um, imaginative creation. The second novel was, was something entirely different. Um, it was a, a, a novel um, set behind the scenes of a, of a reality TV show. And so outside of the, the sort of broad cultural outlines of the reality TV phenomenon. It has nothing to do with them, with any real persons living or dead, as publishers' disclaimers always say. Yeah. Um, as a novelist, I've always been interested in, um, you know, taking sort of the, the structural integrity of some element of history and then building around that, right? So creating within that. Um, is that is that sort of how it works for you? Do you feel like it does give you a bit of structure to work to work within? Well, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, on one hand, it does give you a kind of a kind of structure to work within. Um, you know, historical events they generally have a starting point and an ending point, and um, uh, sort of you know major incidents that 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 define a certain kind of progression or or a certain kind of arc. Um, and so so that can give you um, certain kinds of guide rails. Um, as you're as you're plotting and structuring a novel at the same time though um, as we all know um, you know real life doesn't really have a plot it certainly doesn't have a narrative arc it doesn't have themes it rarely has any kind of closure and so um, to but novels do or 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 usually do or or need to certainly the kind of novels that mainstream publishers acquire and publish and publicize do and so if you're going to write that kind of a novel and you're going to base it on historical events, inevitably the moment comes where you are doing a kind of violence to the real history, to mm -hmm. twist it into the kind of shape that makes for a satisfying novel. That was one of the other major problems with writing The Gringa because it's about a war, um, which even more than everyday real life, has no shape, has um, you know, no clear narrative arc. And as I learned in doing all these interviews in Peru, nobody tells the story of the war the same way. You know, neighbors to this day, 20 years after the war ended, still argue about the most basic facts of the war, when it really started, when it really ended, who was the aggressor and who was just responding, who was responding, how many deaths the government was responsible for, how many deaths the Shining Path was responsible for, how many people disappeared and, and were never returned. I mean, these, these are what we would think of as settled st statistical facts, but nobody agrees on them. And so as I was trying to 
write some sense of the reality of the war into the book, the question kept coming up, well, whose reality um, am, I, am I taking down? And to choose one person's perspective or one person's reality over another um, was to implicitly make a political stand in the novel that I tried very, very hard to avoid making. So that was yet another sort of set of complications that I had to figure out how to navigate. Yeah, it's, it's interesting though, because it, it seems like it, it forces you to think along all the typical story crafting lines, but then, you know, according to this whole other set of, of things as well, right? So it gives you some structure, but then it gives you more issues to settle or things to navigate or like, you know, all right. stuff. Yeah. yeah, at a certain point, you have to take all the things that you've learned or that you think you know and throw them out because mm -hmm. they, they, they're, they're not up to the task. And then you're just really operating without a net. I mean, then, then you're just in terra, terra incognita um, and, you know, throwing out a lot of pages that just don't work because you don't know how to do it. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, Andrea. I appreciate you taking the time to let me ask you some questions. I've really enjoyed talking to you. It's been a real pleasure, Rachel. Thanks to you and thanks to The Lighthouse and everybody stay safe and healthy and sane. And I hope I'll meet you in person sometime. Yeah. All right. Take care. Have a good one.